That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Allison, that was beautiful. That sends chills, doesn't it? I know those of you that have served, when that pops up, you're like, that's me, that's us. I love it, so thank you so much. Uh, So glad that you're here today. If you have a Bible, turn to Titus. It's Titus chapter 3. Yep, kids will make their way to Children's Church so they can head out. And um, Titus chapter 3. Kind of playing out some thoughts that were, uh, that were shared the last couple weeks. I don't know that we could ever hear enough of the fact that it is by grace alone that we are brought into a relationship with God. Like that is, there is no way to earn it. That's what grace is. It's almost humorous to think that it's the grace of God plus something else. Because by definition, that's not Grace is giving you what you don't earn. Grace of God is giving you something that is uh, that's freely given, but the key is that it's unearned. That's it's not just freely given; it's that you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it, and you've not earned it. So I was listening. I was going through uh, driving through Cleveland on a Thursday night, about midnight. I was driving through and actually enjoyed this radio show I was listening to. It was a call-in Catholic uh, theology show. It was actually very interesting. The host was fun and entertaining, but they asked the question about, um, about purgatory and how does that fit with all that Jesus did. If he did that, then why purgatory? And I'm like, Did I call in? That is a great question. And in a fun way, he explained that yes, if not for the grace of God, we wouldn't have the opportunity to go through purgatory to pay for our sins to get to heaven. And I'm like, huh? Now, maybe it's because I was in Cleveland. I mean, they're just kind of wacky in Cleveland. So I didn't know if that was just a Cleveland thing or what that is. But let's not point at another group that diminishes grace because we do it just fine on our own. Because you're hard on yourself. You feel as though very often, oh, I just don't. I open my Bible, but I don't even deserve to open it. I have not opened this in so long, and I've done things wrong. And you just kind of like reluctantly go into the presence of God. Well, that's because you and I have diminished the truth of what grace is. Because built within that feeling bad, built within that is the presumption that Oh, so there is a point in which you shouldn't feel bad because you've lived up to it? So you need to be a certain level of good on your own, live up to where he welcomes you. That's anti-grace. We've never earned it. We'll never deserve it because that's what grace is. So the grace of God has brought us into a relationship with Him. And that grace, that wallowing in the unearned, undeserved favor of God, that is what teaches us to say no to ungodliness and yes to living a good life. Don't separate them. Remember that phrase from a week or so back? Grace is not just pardon of your sin, it's power for daily living. So that same unearned, undeserved favor that brings us into a relationship with God, that same grace is what teaches us to say no to things and yes to things. It's not up to you. You can't do it. It's all through Him. Okay, we haven't even gotten to today yet. You ready? This is today's. Today is, if that's true in your life, if you have been brought into a relationship with God because of grace, and that grace is teaching you to say no to things that you shouldn't do and teaching you to do things that you should do, if that's true, 
it's going to play out into the lives of other people around you, and I'm going to suggest three ways in which it plays out. Some years ago, um, Grant, our oldest, and I whitewatered the Grand Canyon. So it's seven days. You start up in near Page, Arizona, right as you're getting in, Lee's Ferry is what it's called, and then you, you whitewater for seven days in some of the greatest, you know, whitewater rafting there could be. So one day, we're, we're soaked. It's, the water's freezing because it's being let out at the bottom of a dam. So the water is always very frigid. So one day, we're laying out on the rocks, like drying, and we have really good rain gear on that you have to have, and it's all spread out of, we're just like freezing, but soaking in sun. And Grant said something that was kind of funny. You see, all of our life preservers had a name on the back of it, and the name was just named after a rapid. There's 250 rapids through the Grand Canyon, and it just, just so you can keep them straight. And so Grant, cute kid, freshman high school, he said, uh, he goes, hey, you know, I have an idea. Whatever name is on your life preserver, you need to sit in the front of the boat when you go through it. Well, everyone, even the guides thought that was fun. They were like, great idea. And I went, Grant, do you have any idea what name is on the back of your life preserver? And he goes, oh, no. <laughs> and I went, right, you're right. The name on the back of his was Lava. Well, Lava, so if you've, how many of you whitewatered? Anyone? Okay, Colorado or some, Tennessee I know has some good places. So it's a one to five scale are the rapids. It's a one to, it's an international scale. The Grand Canyon is a one to 10. I believe it's the only river in the world that's a one to 10 because of the diversity. Lava's a 10. <laughs> so I was so happy. I'm a bud, it's lava. He goes, is that bad? And I went, oh no, no, it's, it's way worse than bad. It's, it's, like, it's like there's no way. They don't even let you up front through this. It's a 13-foot it's a drop. So when you see it coming, it's literally like the river ends. It was fantastic. Well, best news, it wasn't for another two days. So we had two days to worry about it. Every time he put his jacket on, I said, oh, let me help you with lava. So, long story, hair longer. We get up, and the guides, it's never funny, it's not fun. They, they, they navigate these rivers for a living, and yet it's intense. People die on these rivers, and so they're all focused. As we're all focused, we're focused to put Grant on the front of the boat. And so you don't just hold on. The guide's like, no, 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 that's not going to do. You get your arm around the rope, and if you're not, you know, you're, we're going to pick you up at the end. And so his little face, it was the best in the world. So we go in, and this first dip, uh, we're like straight up and down, looking down at nothing but water. And when you start coming back up, there is this wall of water. We made it through to the end, and it's, we're laughing like junior high girls. We're laughing so hard at what just happened, but we were soaked all the way through. Because we are literally used, we use duct tape. So you duct tape because your jackets are all ripped from the rapids, so you're duct taped tight, and you're kind of like this. We are soaked all the way through laughing, we pull off to the side just to watch other boats come through because it's so much fun. The grace of God, and I wish that somehow we could regularly remember, the grace of God needs to so overwhelm us that we're soaked clear through with the unearned, undeserved favor of God. We reduce it to, I'm reading a devotional today, and I'm going to pray for a minute about, and we, we methodically work through a list of things, which is good. Work through the list of things. Don't, it's, it's like running an oil without engine, or engine without oil. You have to be absolutely immersed 
in the unearned, undeserved favor of God. And if indeed we are so cleansed, I mean water in places, you're absolutely soaked in God's grace. We open a Bible in the morning, and I suppose it changes degrees from day to day, but we open, and the first thing we should say is, I, I, don't, I don't deserve to be here, do I? And he goes, no, come here. Come here. You'll never earn it. But because of Jesus, I love you so much. Come here. Well, let me straighten up first. And I just did some things I shouldn't have done. I'm thinking things I shouldn't. He goes, no, 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 don't. Don't. Right there, snapshot, exactly how you are and where you are, just like that. Come here. But I've done so. I know, I know. That's why I sent Jesus. Is because you'll never earn it. And I love you. And as we then read his word, the humility, as we're like, you're so good to me. Thank, teach me. Help me to change. I want to be like you. And that grace and that understanding of it's so unearned and undeserved, and the love is endless. Remember that phrase? Maybe last two weeks ago, there's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. It's, it's unaffected. And as we live in this overwhelming love, drenched in his love and kindness and grace and forgiveness, we just want to now live for him. Not because he told us to, because his heart wants us to. I want to, and I know you do too, I want to hate the things that he hates. Because he's so good to me. The sin and behavior and attitudes that he doesn't want, I want to not like those as much as he doesn't like those. I want to love and do things the way he does things. Loving your family, oh, it can be challenging. I've met some of your family. It can be challenging, right? But how about loving your enemy? How is that pop? It's grace. It's that same overwhelming grace that he's loved you, that you're drenched in, that you can love an enemy because you're God's enemy, that you were. You were against him with all that you said and thought. You were selfish against him. He loved you. Same grace through us to others. If you have your Bible there to, to Titus, if you've got it open, it's uh, Titus 3. And we pray, and we're going to read a couple verses. Father, thank you for, uh, we can't thank you enough, for your kindness, your love. We prove every day we don't deserve it. But Father, you keep loving us. Thank you. And I'm praying that today, that as we look into that being drenched in your grace, that we'll see how it can flow through us into the lives of other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 3, verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, astray, sli slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He loved us. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing, regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. First thing we do is when we're overwhelmed by God's grace, and those are in verses 11 to 15 in chapter 2, it says the grace of God has appeared, it brings salvation, teaches us to say no to these things, yes to these things. If we've done that, the first thing is that we will treat people with respect and consideration. He names a unique group for this, which is intriguing. Remind them. That's funny too. Remind them. Well, you're going to know this. If you're overwhelmed and soaked, drenched, in God's grace, you will only be nice and kind and considerate and loving and non-judgmental because you're soaked in His grace. So he said, just remind them of the, now that the impetus is, now it's moving, now it's going. Remind them, point them. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Really? You're going to name them? where people say, I don't know, but in America, we got some really bad rulers and authority. We don't have a fraction of bad rulers and authority compared to what he's talking about. We're talking about Rome. (laughs) Because I hear that so often. I don't want to be submission because they're they're wasting our money and they're ruining the nation. And Go through the list. I agree with all of that. They're not as bad as what the group that he was talking about. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and ready to do good work. Out of anything to say, after the grace of God talk, he mentions this. It's more important for God's people to be known as being grace-filled than to be known as an agitator of our political foes. And that hurts a lot of us. What's the religious right known for? The word that's most quickly associated with religious right is the word agitator. It's not the word grace. It's not grace-filled. It's agitating. I might be wrong with you. You may not be that way, but collectively, we're that way. Well, it says here, remind them to be submissive to authorities. Be obedient and ready to do every good work. We're not a political movement. I like the fact that we'll get together and we have political clout. I'm one of Jerry's kids, Jerry Falwell. That's what Jerry Falwell used to call us. He goes, we're Jerry's kids because of the, okay. That was moral majority era. I mean, that was, that was political clout. I get it. I, I'm, I'm for that because if every Christian in America decided to vote according to the moral code of the Scriptures, do you not think we'd probably make a difference? That's true, isn't it? So I'm not against the we wield our power and strength when we can and we should. But there is a line. There is a line. When I get a a Facebook post or something sent that's derogatory about maybe a political character that I don't like, oh, there's part of me that loves that. But there's a part of me that says, that is embarrassing that I like that. i got to care more about their walk with Christ. Well, but they're ruining America. Yeah, and God's really out of control on that. He doesn't know what to do. It's really catching God off guard right now. No, who puts the authorities in place? He does, doesn't he?
Our love and kindness for people should outweigh our disagreement with their ideas. We had a congresswoman at my last church, and she is an agitator. That's why I'm not going to give you her name. Far political right. Truthfully, I agree with about everything she says uh, in content. But in Congress, she's an agitator. And I'm like, uh, you know what? I don't, I don't think it excuses it, does it? I mean, are they, like we got pushed too far. We got to draw the line. Why is it on you? Is that, is that it? I didn't know that. I didn't know that the direction of America was on us. No, as a believer in Christ, we're more concerned about grace going through us and winning people with the grace of God and showing them the undeserved, unearned favor, the same favor that we received. That's what we do. And I don't know, I'll involve myself. I'll vote every time except last Tuesday because I don't have a Pennsylvania driver's license. But every other time, I'll vote and I'll participate and I'll speak to issues. But draw that line. Look at verse 2 because now he opens it up. And this is interesting that he does this because he first says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. But now in verse 2, twice he opens it to everyone. Speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling, be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. I can't just change it. You know, I... You know, I I see the videos, the montage of our president, whether he's tripping or walking a direction he shouldn't walk, or and it's amazing how many Christians are forwarding that. Like, that's funny. Oh, I get it. I I get the funny side. I'm okay. Because you can do that with any president. It's not just this one. The funny clips. But that's not funny. That's demeaning. It's agitating. Have we gone to that level of personal? How about if we put videos of each of us online of dumb things we've said? (laughs) Aren't you glad there's not a microphone around? (laughs) You say, well, I don't know how to correct it. You don't have to correct that. Soak in the grace of God on a regular basis that you're drenched in his kindness, his undeserved, unearned favor. You're drenched in it. And as we keep going back and keep being drenched in it, it does nothing but bring an increasing amount of humility and non-judgment. It increasingly changes us to this. That's why it's remind you. Let me just remind you to be submissive. Let me remind you to be obedient, ready to do every good work. Speak evil of no one. Uh, That would be an essay all on its own. Who of this day, Roman Empire, because they're in Crete. This isn't Jerusalem. They're in Crete. Who of that day there had been plenty to speak evil of? because they're doing horrible things. No, speak evil of no one. Don't quarrel. Be gentle. Well, the only way to do this is that we're overwhelmed in God's grace. So here's a second one. The first one is we, we'll treat people with respect and consideration. Um, and I didn't bring up the politics, by the way. He did. Just saying. So write your letter to him. I'd rather not say any of it. It's right there. Uh, We'll remember where we came from. This is a little tricky. If we're full of grace, we will remember where we came from. So the best way, I think, to explain this is, um, before we read the text, imagine imagine you're sitting um, in um, in in a den, a somewhat dimly lit and grandpa sitting there. So if you're a grandpa age, it's going to be a little awkward because you're sitting real close next to grandpa. 
So we got two grandpas for the rest of us. But, okay, you're sitting there, and you're just sitting there next to wise grandpa. And you're saying, I know, grandpa, I need to be more graceful. I'm not grace-filled enough. It's in me. I receive Jesus. I trust the Lord for my salvation. I just need to allow that grace to flow through me better. I get it. It's hard. You're going to keep complaining. Keep going on this. It's hard. Government is immoral. Literally wasting hard-earned money. The people I'm dealing with, so difficult. At school, teachers not fair. Maybe at work. I want to retaliate. I'm getting mad because I'm not being treated right. My coach isn't putting me in. They should be. I'd rather argue. I want to argue and just get in their face. Hold my ground. Then Grandpa says, verse 4, verse 3, Grandpa voice, for we ourselves were foolish, disobedient, led astray. We were slaves to all various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. You see what Paul just did there? He goes, oh, I hear you. Oh, I hear all of that. Your boss isn't fair. There's no, your boss is after you. It's pretty clear. The coach clearly has favorites. I get it. You're up against something hard here. Government, very frustrating. We're Arizona. We're right at the border. I cross that border a lot. That is a frustrating subject for an Arizonan, New Mexico, Texas. That's frustrating. I don't know what to do. I don't know, how do I show grace? I have an idea. How about, for we ourselves, we were foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days with malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Do you see what he did? You're the same way. This is what happened. You you were that. You were all of that. And in the middle of all of that, God drenched you with his unearned, undeserved favor. You didn't deserve it then, and you still don't. Do you see the hypocrisy? How can I be so kind? How can I be not an agitator to people that are, have nothing but ill will about me and my family and our church and our Jesus? How is that possible? He goes, well, because you too were that way. That's why. Don't forget where you came from. I'm, you know we've been Christians so long. How many of us have been Christian a long time? Others are newer. We've been a long time. Don't forget that you too, you didn't earn it. That perspective, that holy perspective, you didn't earn that. It was given to you. Graciously, unearned, undeserved, handed to you. Let's not forget where we've been. And then I love what he does, his third point, of where he comes back to. Verses 4 to 7. This grace-filled life, this being overwhelmed, we treat people with respect and consideration. We remember where we've come from. And then thirdly, a grace-filled life will often find itself drifting back to the story of Jesus. So look what he did there. It's, you could feel the movement of this in Paul's mind. You could you kind of see where his mind was moving. 
because he says remind them, be submissive, so he gives his instructions. You need to be obedient, work hard, don't speak evil of people. Then verse 3, because we know we were the same way. Paul says, yeah, I was there too. I fought the church. But if not for that road, that light, if Jesus hadn't revealed himself, I'd still be there. And then verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's such a refreshing burst in this conversation. Because of His grace, you're going to treat people right. Remember where you've been, but then remember it's when the goodness and loving kindness of God appeared, He saved you by grace, not because of anything you've done. I mean, He gets right back to the gospel. So as we're all talking, and those that... uh, Lori right here in the front puts this online on Tuesday mornings. That's when it's always available. If you're ever wanting to, uh, if you miss a Sunday, it's always up by Tuesday morning. Um, So those of you watching either online or in here right now, you got to get back to this. Do you know for certain that you have been washed in God's grace? Has to start there. That overwhelming of his grace. Notice he also uses the word mercy in there. Because the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Remember of mercy, the difference? Mercy takes you to neutral. Mercy is not giving you the punishment you deserve. Withholding punishment. Grace is giving you everything you didn't deserve, unearned. It's mercy and his grace that he's given to us. If you're bitter and unforgiving, demeaning, judgmental, that's the sign of somebody who's not received and living in the grace. It's impossible. You you can't I hear the words, oh, I came to the Lord here and I was by His grace, and you turn around and we're graceless, that's from a graceless person. So tell me the prayer and all of that. I, I get all the exteriors are right, but when you're drenched and drenched in His grace, and when you walk, it's like, because you're full of His grace. You can't help it. You can't help when you hug someone that grace just squirts out. You can't fake it. There's, if somebody said to me, I've whitewatered the Grand Canyon, I said, oh, that's great. That's, that's amazing. We have. We've several. Sarah was pregnant with Ross. She whitewatered the Grand Canyon at a different time. And if somebody said to me, oh, yeah, oh, I've been through lava, it's okay, I would go, oh, all right. And I'd walk away and go, they've not been through lava. That's just clear. You, you, you haven't. You couldn't have. You may have studied it because it is actually lava rock. It's, you could study what it looked like. It's narrow. It's a fabulous little chasm that you're going through the Grand Canyon, and that drop is just ridiculous. And... You don't say, it was all right. That's the way it is with grace. If you're really drenched in grace, if you've really soaked in not just the doctrine of it, not just the head where you can explain it, but you actually went through it and lived daily in the drenching of His grace, if that's really true, That is a person who will be increasingly less demeaning and judgmental and unforgiving and critical. Doesn't mean we won't be, right? Because it's not played its way through yet. It's called sanctification, progressive 
sanctification. It takes time. I get that. But snapshot you from two years from now and two years ago, that's what we could do. Let's take somebody's name and let's just all get together and say, let, have them even in front of us, sitting in a chair, and say, let's talk about you two years ago. Are you less and name all these things than you were two years ago. That'd be fun. That'd be awesome. We could like just submit names of who we'd like to do this with. And I'll tell you, it would actually be a lot of fun because I know already enough of you to know that we would gather around you and say, actually, you should have known them two years ago because they've changed a lot. They are more grace-filled. They were more judgmental. Or how many of us would say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm still a bit judgmental, but nothing like I used to be, right? How many would you say that in a sentence? Yes, I might be this way now, but nothing like what I used to be, right? That is a tribute to God's grace, not to you. That means you've been sitting alone with Jesus, haven't you? You've been opening up the Word and soaking and living in His grace, haven't you? And you go, I have. We can tell. Because it's improving. It's getting better. Some of us have started off so bad that you're like, oh, there's no way your grace feels. Oh, no, you should have seen me two years ago. They're like, it was worse? Is that possible? Mm, it was worse. Should have seen it two years before that. But that's what grace does. And does it gracefully. Jesus is quite the gentleman. We've all been hit with a two-by-four now and then, right, in life, for our behavior, our thoughts, where he's just like, okay, enough. <laughs> And we, we stagger a little. Okay, I'm not doing that again. But generally, it's pretty smooth. It's pretty kind-hearted. Only by living in the live stream of God's grace would we find within us the ability to respond correctly to those around us, no matter the setting. So there's a, a story of a, uh, a family's daughter grew up in Traverse City, Michigan. This is in Philip Yancey's book, uh, What's So Amazing About Grace. Anyone read it? What's So Amazing About Grace? Yeah, yeah. Did you like it? It's a fun one, isn't it? I just bought Yancey's book on prayer because uh, Mark uh, Poach mentioned uh, the Maxwell book on prayer partners. And I finished, that's a great one. And then it kind of, he quoted this one by Yancey. So I got the one on prayer by Yancey. If you want an, a good book on grace, Philip Yancey's. That would be, that would, that's going to challenge you. Family's daughter grew up in Traverse City, Michigan, and kind of disgusted by her old-fashioned parents who kind of overreacted to her nose ring, music she listened to, length of skirts, she decided to run away. This gal ended up in Detroit where she met a man who drove a big car oddly similar to the one I drive. <laughs> My boy's in college at Grand Canyon University, which is in the near ghetto of Phoenix. And when he drove, the 77 Cadillac is actually his, my 21-year-old's. And when he drives around that because of the crime and prostitution everywhere, I said, when you drive by in your 77 Cadillac, just keep your head down. Don't wear a hat with a feather. Because you're going to look like Huggy Bear. Who knows who Huggy Bear is? Nice. That's old school stuff right there. So this poor gal, uh, driving the biggest car, treated her terrific. She actually had to call her boss. She was wooed into working for him and made a premium price. 
wasn't long before things went bad, went from really good pay to bad, long sickness. She was heartbroken and amazed how quickly boss literally tossed her and the curb. Penniless, empty, drug addicted at this point, broken, and more lost than ever. One night while sleeping in the metal grates of the city, she began feeling like a lost little girl that she was, and she began to whimper and saying, God, why did I even leave? Why did I leave? I just want to go home. After a third missed call calling home, she finally left a message, and this is what she left. Mom, Dad, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way. I'll be there at midnight tomorrow. And if you're not there, I understand. Well, during the seven-hour bus ride, preparing a speech for her father and the scenarios of what could happen when she lands in her hometown, sure enough, it stops. Traverse City Station, the driver announces, 15-minute stop. She waits and waits and finally walks out into the terminal, not having any idea what to expect. But not one of the thousand scenes in which she had played out in her mind prepared for her, prepared for what she was about to see. There in the bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stood a group of about 40 brothers, sisters, she names great aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmother, even great grandmother, all wearing goofy party hats, blowing noisemakers, noise taped across the entire wall of the terminal was a cheap computer generated banner that said, Welcome home. Out of the crowd of well wishers broke her dad, and she stared through her quivering, tear filled eyes about to give her memorized speech, to which he goes, shh, 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 not interested. We just got to get you home. We just got to get you home. And I'm going to tell you that story is each of our story. It doesn't have to be Detroit. It doesn't have to be life of crime. You and I absolutely completely lost. There's, there's no hope. Lost. Nothing you could do. Until Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for you. He loves you. You didn't have to clean up. He just said, just the way you are with dirty and sin and a mind that was just messed up by anything from drugs to things that you've seen and watched, it didn't matter because he loves you exactly the way you are and he throws his arms around you and says, shh, I don't need to hear it. You're home now. It's okay. And if you've never received Jesus Christ, faith in him, that's all it is. It's looking at him and accepting the hug. Belief in Him only. If you've never done that, don't leave today without. For the rest who you're like, yeah, I have come to know Christ, but I'm going to tell you, I've drifted from the grace. I've stayed with the church, or I've stayed with ideas, and I'll even read things that are Christian things, but it's all head stuff. I've drifted. I want the grace back into the wallowing in his goodness and his kindness. That might be you today. And it's available to every one of us. And you say, well, I, I know Christ. I, I remember those days when he just immersed me in grace, and I do live in his grace. So for all of us who are that way, let's accept the challenge to receive people through grace. Let's show the grace. It's in you. Just show the grace. Never forgetting that you were there too. And never forgetting where and how it is you've been brought out of it. It's not because of things that we've done, righteous things that we've done, but by his mercy that he saved us. Would you give an amen to that? Amen.
Let's pray together right now. Let's bow in prayer. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never received His grace, you can do it right this minute. Heads are bowed, quietness of this moment right now. Just say to God, it's between you and Him. You can pray, Heavenly Father, I need you. Thank you for dying for me. I trust you for eternal life. I trust you for forgiveness of sin, for freshness of living. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for washing me in forgiveness. And no one looking around, heads are bowed. If you just prayed along with me, I want to be able to thank the Lord for you. You don't have to come anywhere up front. I'm not asking anything from you except just lift your hand up so I see it to say, yeah, I prayed along with you. And then you could put it right back down again. Yep, God bless you. God bless you. Yep, thank you. Anybody else? Greatest decision of your life. I'm so grateful for you. For the rest of us, are we grace-filled? Are we showing the grace that's in us? Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing morning. We've celebrated veterans and we're forever grateful for these men and women who have served and are serving. Thank you for the worship, time together, the fellowship. Opportunity to give was a pleasure. And thank you for the renewal of the grace. What a message. Your word, we're grateful for it today. In Jesus' name, amen.